our minute. And we'll, our, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the October AIDS Clinical Conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jeff Shouten, who many of you know. I've had the pleasure of working with Jeff for the entire time that I've been here at Madison Clinic. Uh, he was a longtime primary care provider here and then moved on to uh, advanced training in anal dysplasia, and that's the topic that he's going to be speaking about today. He is a clinical associate professor emeritus, both in the departments of medicine and uh, in general surgery, where he, in which he originally trained as a general surgeon. He also has a law degree. He is a very well qualified person here, and he has an academy, uh, HIV Academy, um, sorry, American Academy of HIV Medicine um, certification as well. Um, and he has been an investigator in a um, multi-center trial that many of you know about called the Anchor Study, um, which recently published a paper regarding its findings. And he's gonna talk about that and the implications for care of people with HIV with anal dysplasia. So thank you so much, Jeff. Thanks, thanks Teresa, and good morning, everyone. So I have a lot of slides to go through. I'm gonna go through, try to go through quickly so I have a little time to discuss um, implications here of the Anchor Study, because it is a very significant study. So I, I have no conflicts to discuss. I will mention off-label product uses. Uh, this, these lectures are sponsored by um, NIH here. Um, and data here is a limited perspective on how social economic factors impact health. But we will, I will show you the anchor enrolled a pretty good representative population of people living with HIV. Um, so I'm going to go through a quick overview of HPV and anal cancer risk, talk about contemporary terminology, the importance of the DARE or the digital anal rectal exam, the high resolution anoscopy exam. I know many of you, all of you probably refer patients to me and may not have an idea what I do back in that treatment room every Thursday and Friday. So I hope to give you some idea of that. Talk about the anchor study, the critically important study and possible implementation challenges and how to go forward with possibly screening. So just quickly highlight, this is a study in Lancet Global Health recently, that HPV is pretty ubiquitous. You know, there's so much stigma associated with HPV infection. I always emphasize this with new patients that I see that, you know, one in three men worldwide are infected at least one HPV type, according to this recent study, and one in five infected with high risk types. Prevalence is very high in men over age 15. Most acquisition occurs soon after sexual debut. And um, so, um, so if you look at the age prevalence in this study, um, any HPV was quite prevalent. Even high-risk HPV was quite prevalent here in, in all age groups across the spectrum here. And even HPV 16, what we think is the most aggressive type, is fairly common as well. And you can see this is a global problem. These just show across the geographic regions, HPV is quite ubiquitous in men in this study. And likewise in women. So, you know, women and young girls have been vaccinated more aggressively than young boys were early on, although now both groups should be vaccinated. But this is an interesting study just published in Health Form, JAMA Health Form, looking at the prevalence in two different geographic time points um, prior to vaccination in birth cohorts. And then a recent period, interestingly, looking in the recent period, both groups that were vaccinated and groups that were not vaccinated to see if there's any evidence of any herd immunity being acquired in this study. So this was a cross-sectional study of the Ann Haynes data from two different time points. And uh, these are self-reported data and um, in terms of vaccination history, but and self-collected cervical vaginal swabs. And we'll talk about the limitations of self-collection later. But this find, findings showed there was a significant reduction in the recent, both the birth cohorts of both vaccinated and unvaccinated women. So this is exciting. This would indicate that even though we haven't achieved universal vaccination, we are having an effect on herd immunity. And declines seen then in the recent time periods in the most aggressive types, type 16 and 18. So this is you know showing some evidence that we are making some progress and hopefully eliminating both general, uh, general anal and cervical cancers related to HPV. But the problem is currently there are a lot of people living with HIV who have HPV infection as well as women. And um, you can see we've made significant improvements in um, rates of new cases of cervical cancer. Death rates are declining. For anal cancer, though, the opposite is happening. In spite of um, improved viral suppression, 
the incidence of anal cancer continues to go up. It's not as high as cervical cancer, but nonetheless, it's still increasing as are death rates. So what do we know about anal cancer? These are slides from the anchor study deck. Um, anal cancer is definitely more frequent in HIV positive men and women, and I'll show you some of that data in a minute. Um, men who have sex with men, we estimate maybe 35 times more likely to develop anal cancer. And HIV positive men of sex with men are 80 to 130 times more likely will show anal cancer incidence that were actually much higher than this in the anchor study. And as I mentioned, anal cancer incidence continue to rise, rise in people living with HIV and women despite antiviral therapy. And um, anal cancer is always preceded by what we call, what I'll call LCL for the remainder of the talk or high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. So this is an anal cancer risk score study, the most recent data from the NCI. And you see here both in men, both MSM and non-MSM, the, the inc very dramatic increased rates here in people living with HIV, and particularly in MSM. These are 75 to 100 incidents uh, per 100,000 versus one to two in, in women without HIV here is the baseline rate. And so this, this is the population we really focus on, but we enroll men and women in anchor. And then we have this large group of moderate risk people that are increased, significantly increased against the baseline incidence of one to two per 100,000. And what we do about screening for this population remains unclear. This would be women with uh, HPV related vulva, vaginal or cervical disease, people who are immune compromised for other reasons, either due to um, therapy or post-transplant. So that's a large population. So in general, we know that about five, and this bore, was borne out by the um, anchor study, um, five out of 10 asymptomatic men have anal age cell who are living with HIV or MSM. So this is very, very prevalent. And um, it's estimated that one in 10 over their lifetime will get anal cancer. In women, it's estimated that maybe anal, anal HL is less prevalent. About two out of 10 women may have anal HL. We don't really know what the risk of anal cancer is. We certainly don't see nearly as many anal cancer cases develop in women living with HIV as we do with men. And, and the known risk factors then we know are oncogenic strains of HPV, particularly HPV 16 and 18, but there are you know 15 or 20 other oncogenic strains of HPV that are reported to be associated with cervical and anal cancer. Older age is a risk factor. I'll show you the incident curves on that. Having a low CD4 nadir is like many other um, long-term complications of HIV, there's com consequences of that long-term. Um, smoking is certainly a risk factor. So a history of cervical vulva HCL, although, like I said, we don't see as many anal HCLs as we you would think in women who also have HCL in the cervical and vulva region. A history of genital warts, just a marker of HPV acquisition, although they're due to the lower strains of HPV. This is the current terminology that we use, though, for um, classification of, of all lesions in the anal genital tract. So these come out of a set of recommendations, the Journal of Lower General Tract Disease references here, published in 2012. And this standardized their uh, definitions across the spectrum. You know, we used to think there was a, a spectrum of evolution from mild to moderate dysplasia to severe dysplasia. This archaic term, which I really am sorry to say is still, I still see in some pathology reports, particularly from outside of the UW in situ carcinoma. High-grade dysplasia is not a carcinoma. This is a misnomer. Um, then we were using the grading one, two, three, but now we know there's a bright line here based on the biology of HPV. The high-risk HPV strains induce high-grade dysplasia, which is this abnormal cell growth, a lot of mitotic activity. I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. And then L-cell or condylomas with these coilocytes here in, in the upper stratum of the epithelium. And, and in these borderline lesions that are still kind of mild to moderate, the pathologist now does P16 staining, all high-grade lesions stain positive for P16. So that becomes kind of the decider on the on lesions that still sit in the middle here. And then there's a basement membrane there. And only if these cells invade through the basement membrane is when you develop what's called a microinvasive or a CISCA, super, superficially invasive squamous cell carcinoma, specifically defined as um, no wider than seven millimeters and no greater depth than four millimeters. 
And ciscus actually can be treated by local excision if you can do sphincter sparing surgery. So an important part of the exam, and, and I wish all referrals that I receive uh, have a digital anal rectal exam done prior to the referral, which helps me triage them, but that's oftentimes not the case. We use the term, and this comes from the um, International Anal Neoplasia Society, this publication here, reference. It, it basically is an extension of what used to, we used to call the digital rectal exam. And under, under like, unlike in a digital rectal exam, the DARE includes palpation of the entire anal canal Visualization, visualization and palpation of the anal margin, which we define as five centimeters from the anal verge. And, um, you know, there's some recommendations on how often to do this. There are no standard guidelines yet, but basically, you know, the higher risk that someone is for anal cancer with the greatest risk group being those HIV positive men from sex with men um, and, and lower down men, you know, HIV negative MSM less frequently. But, um, this, it's an important exam to do. Certainly, if you have a mass that's abnormal, high-grade dysplasia is not palpable, so it's not going to be effective in screening people with high-grade dysplasia. But it's certainly, if, if you have an abnormal there, then I prioritize those uh, referrals because then you may have gone on to more of an invasive lesion. So I'm going to briefly go over what the HRA exam is so that people understand when, I'm ref when you refer people to me what I'm doing and the terminology we use. So. The exam takes about 15 to 20 minutes, no sedation needed, no bowel prep needed. Um, we examine the entire perianal skin, the anal verge, the anal canal up through the transition zone. We have the um, squamous epithelium transformation zone up to the squamocolumnar junction. So that's an adequate exam would examine all those areas of the anal canal up above to the internal sphincter there. So this is the setup I use in, in the treatment room. We have a, a, a monitor with a CPU that captures image. We have a high resolution digital camera that captures images. And then this is a model, this is not a coposcope. This is an anoscope. Coposcopes can't be used for anoscopy because the center bar gets in the way and the focal distances are, are different. So the essential equipment for the procedure, uh, pretty simple. Uh, Dacron polyester or polyester swabs for the anal cytology, which I'll show you some thin prep to put the cytology in, uh, just disposable anoscopes. And most of the biopsies we do are with what are called baby tissues that I'll show you. And then some lidocaine, and I always buffer my lidocaine. I only use injectable lidocaine if we're doing biopsies on the perianal area. Intraanal exams, we just use our lidocaine gel topical lubricant, and we don't need to anesthetize more than that for intraanal biopsies where most of our lesions are located. So here's just a setup for the tray, the thin prep, the Dacron polyester swab, um, and then some acetic acid and some iodine, Rugal's iodine. Um, so initially we start with the DARE. You can't put any lubricant in. Lubricant interferes with the, with the cytology exam. So this has to be done with just a tap water moistened Dacron or polyester swab, just gently spreading the anal verge. In insert the swab, you actually can feel it go past the anal sphincter. And, and so it goes in a couple of centimeters. And then just sweeping in a circular fashion, we just sweep that swab on the sides of the anal canal as we're slowly withdrawing it. I actually count to 10 as I'm withdrawing it. So it's a very slow withdrawing, sweeping pretty vigorously the sides of the anal canal to get an adequate cell sample. Then just vigorously shake, shake that thin prep swab in, uh, shake the swab in thin prep for about 20 seconds quite vigorously, discard the swab. And you order a non-GYN cytology request and select anal swab, and then pathology will process that. Are you also then on that same thin prep drawer? You can order HPV typing, and we'll talk about that later. You don't need a second swab or anything. The, the fluid in the cytology cells is adequate both for cytology and doing a HPV DNA testing if you choose to order that. And then we put a little gauze with acetic acid, leave it in the anal canal for about a minute, and then... Um, carefully examine the perianal area um, using the coposcope and the power range we use is 16 to 25 power is what you'll see on these images here. Um, for deaf terminology of lesions, it's really frustrating when people use the clock and say something's at like three o'clock. And I don't know whether, what position the patient were in, were they right lateral decubitus, left lateral, prone, jackknife. So we use just these anatomic termination uh, locations 
So everyone that I do my exam in generally is usually on the left lateral decubitus position. So we just designate everyone anatomically in these opt-ins here, either right or left lateral, anterior, posterior, and then right or left um, anterior, posterior. So that way we can localize lesions and know what we're talking about when I refer people to surgery and there's no confusion over clock terminology. So this is what a normal exam looks like. This is the pink healthy rectal mucosa. This is the transformation zone, the squamo-columnar junction here. It's always at irregular levels as you go around. A complete exam examines everything, including all these folds. Hemorrhoids can be a challenge. But this is thin, pearly, translucent epithelium. This is normal squamous columnar junction and transformation zone. Likewise, you can see some islands of med a transformation here, skip lesions, that, that's normal. Again, this is thin, pale, translucent and that's a normal apparent trans transition zone. And with iodine, normal epithelium should stay dark brown. The abnormal areas don't pick up the iodine, they actually stay kind of yellow like this. So healthy epithelium, so the iodine and vinegar complement each other. And then part of the exam as well is the perianal area. We certainly can uh, see perianal lesions as well, um, although mostly they're internal. And this is the terminology that we use here um, just so you know, when you see my notes, when I'm describing lesions, we just desc describe the contour as a flat or raised, what the surface pattern is, is a papular, is a granular, is it smooth? And vascularity is really important, as I'll show you in the abnormal slides coming up. We call punctation, mosaic pattern, warty vessels. These are always um, associated with high-grade dysplasia, usually. Describe the margins, describe the Lugol staining. If it's Lugol positive or complete, then that's not going to be a high-grade lesion. If it's Lugol's negative, it can still be a low-grade lesion, but it could be high-grade. So there's no stain in pattern that's actually totally accurate. So still we end up biopsying a lot of lesions. And this is another variant that we see. This is kind of related to what I think of as more of an acute HPV infection, squamous metaplasia. You see these very irregular margins, a little whitening with the uh, vinegar. But these are what high-grade lesions look like. Again, these, these are quite subtle. These are not palpable. But these are distinct, very pathognomonic vessel changes for high-grade dysplasia. You can see the acetal whitening here, a little thickening. And um, here you see what's called punctate vessels and mosaic pattern vessels over here. These are both high-grade lesions. This is another example with both um, some coarse punctation here, over here, and some mosaic vessels as well. And you can see the acetal whitening. So these are pretty subtle lesions, you know. But this is the normal pearly translucent epithelium. This is the acetal white area with vessel changes. And these will all be Lugol's negative. So this is a good example here, again, of striated vessels. Again, very commonly associated with high-grade dysplasia. And then this is another variant. This always extends um, more proximal to the SCJ. This very thin white um, acetal white areas with what we call glandular ring, ring glands here. This is called, we call this lacy metaplasia. This is very benign looking, but it's almost always high grade dysplasia when we biopsy it. And you can see perianal lesions. Perianal lesions are even more difficult to assess. The perianal skin is keratinized. It's traumatized from wiping and, and other trauma. And you can see high grade being white thickening like this here, but you also can see high grade being this erythematous raised area. So it can be very difficult to, and you have to inject lidocaine to biopsy these because there's much more innovation in the perianal area than intraanal. This is what high-grade dysplasia looks like on the, pathologically though. Here's the basement membrane. You wanna be sure that's intact. There's no cells breaching that basement membrane. And then you see mitotic figures up into the upper third the, above the basal layer here. And this is definitely a high-grade lesion, as opposed to low-grade lesions where you see a little bit of proliferation down here near the basement membrane, but then see these coilocytes up, up here that you see. This is keratinized epithelium, so this was a perianal lesion here. The intraanal lesions are non-keratinized. And then this is what anal cancer looks like. So this is an obvious anal cancer. Not all of them are this obvious, but you see these, we call these warty vessels. So we pay a lot of attention to abnormal vascularity because that generally gets associated with more aggressive high-grade disease. So these are both these are both palpable lesions actually, and on biopsy were invasive cancers. This is a patient I had about eight eight months ago. 
referred to me for a perianal lesion, was thought to be maybe a wart. This is this is an obvious cancer. When I saw him, I explained to him, I thought this is probably cancer. You see the punctate vessels. This wasn't that hard a lesion, though. Not all cancers get a lot of fibrotic changes, so some of them can be quite hard and indurated. A lot of them are not, though. So I was able to get a diagnosis of invasive cancer. He went on to chemo radiation therapy. There's no way you can locally excise this extensive lesion. And this is his six post radiation therapy, six month visit, healing in nicely and no evidence of recurrence yet. We do use some topical treatments, but mostly we use um, ablation or electrocautery in treating these lesions. Um, the two topical applications we, pre we use are either Micromod or Aldera. Um, which has no direct HPV effect, but, you know, is an immune stimulant. It doesn't really work well in immunocompromised patients. So pretty much reserve this for immunocompetent patients, um, particularly younger people who are HIV negative with condyloma. Uh, the application is three times a week at night for up to 16 weeks. We do use, if we use topicals, although we try to use ablation, which I'll talk about in a minute, I'll use 5 fluorouracil or Effidex as a primary choice for extensive HCL in immunocompromised patients. And the dosing of that you see here are five-day BID cycles every two weeks, so five days on, nine days off, and do eight cycles. Uh, Virgin isn't very effective, so really don't use it. There's some other compounds. We used a little bit of TCA, trop topically trichloroacetic acid in small lesions. Mostly what we use to treat high-grade dysplasia is the hyphricator. I used to use an infrared coagulator, which you see here. The hyphricator is a, is a nice uh, tool though to ablate lesions. We use a smoke evacuated tubing because this is an aerosol generating procedure. We actually were testing everyone for COVID during the early COVID era. We don't pretest for COVID any longer, but um, we do use the smoke evacuator, the smoke evacuated channel inside this hyphricator tip and runs through a smoke evacuator. So a nice little procedure set up and works very well to ablate high-grade lesions. So with that background, then let's talk about the anchor study. So why would anal screening and treatment of HCL maybe not work? Why was the anchor study even done? And why the current Society for Colorectal Surgeons don't even recommend doing HRA exams? Well, in, in many at-risk people, lesions are large and multifocal. Clinicians may miss lesions that I try to show you. Lesions are quite subtle and oftentimes multifocal. Clinicians may inadequately treat lesions. Recurrence is a problem, which I'll show you was a problem in Anchor as well. And new lesions often arise. One other thing I would put on here is there's a spontaneous resolution rate. About a third of people with anal HCL will have those lesions resolved spontaneously. So that was another reason why people were skeptical of the benefit of treatment. However, Treatment with early cancer results in much higher survival rates. And being in the anchor study afforded the people who progress that we'll talk about with a very high cure rate because we found mostly localized disease. Very few had regional lymph nodes. And, of, and you know, even if the regional lymph nodes cures, survival drops down to two thirds. And for distant disease, survival is not very common. So early diagnosis is, is beneficial. So again, the survival rate is lower for more advanced disease. So uh, among those who do survive, there's substantial morbidity also. So if you can prevent treatment, even if the um, survival rate is good, um, it's high for people with limited disease, there's a lot of morbidity with chemo radiation therapy, short-term in everyone and long-term in a lot of people as well. So this is the anchor study funded by the NCI. Um, this is the primary publication, just for your reference, for this paper we published in June of 2022 after the DSMB put a halt on enrollment in the study. Um, so there were four aims of the study. One, to determine whether treatment of anal HCL is effective in reducing incidence of anal cancer. So this was a clinical endpoint study and determine the safety of treatment. We developed the first quality of life uh, tool for assessing um, treatment and related impacts. And, uh, and that's been validated and published now. And then also to identify factors for progression to cancer and viral markers of progression to cancer. Th this work is yet to be done. This is gonna be a very important um, finding of the, of the anchor study in the coming couple of years. This was the study schema, the very simple eligibility requirements, people living with HIV age 35 and older. Originally we had excluded people with a prior history of HCL 
and and later we modified the protocol to allow them to, to come in. Also, it initially excluded people where they had HPV vaccine, but then we modified the protocol to allow them to enroll as well. Um, simple randomization schema here: H H cell not found, not not enrolled. Cancer found, obviously not enrolled. And we'll talk about those cases that were found at screening, the prevalent cases. And then if if H cell found, then they were randomized to an active monitoring or a treatment arm. And we'll talk about the details of those arms. Um, so the initial design of the study was projected to screen about 17,000 participants to enroll 5,058. We actually ended up enrolling, uh, screening only 10,000 to enroll almost 5,000 people. So this is where that 50% estimate comes of, of, of people living with HIV. We found half of them had HL, and these are asymptomatic people. So this is very prevalent, and this re, re creates a problem for determining how we implement and go forward with these findings. There were a few people excluded who had um, the 17 cases of anal cancer that we found at baseline. I, I found one of those here in our screening in Seattle. Um, and then there were some other, um, if they didn't have HL, they weren't eligible. There were a few people who had extensive condylomas or some other reasons why they couldn't come in the study. The study design though was powered to, de to detect a difference in incidence of two, 50 per 100 person year, 1,000 person years in the treatment arm versus 200 per 100,000 person years in the active monitoring arm. So this was the statistical design of the study. It was an event-driven analysis. The primary outcome was a clinical endpoint, a hard clinical endpoint of time to cancer. And the projected um, sample size then was derived to be 5,058 to detect what we thought would be 31 anal cancers. These were the sites that enrolled the anchor study, pretty good geographic distribution of sites. We had uh, three sites here in Seattle, Polyclinic, Harborview. I also went out to Virginia Mason and enrolled people there in the study. Polyclinic eventually dropped out when the new buyer of Polyclinic unfortunately ended all the clinical research. But these were the sites around the country. And um, this is the treatment on basically a pretty simple schema. This did not compare different types of treatment. So the provider could choose in consultation with the patient and any treatment for high grade that they thought was most appropriate. Most everyone used hyfrication, which we'll talk about here. But so at randomization, if they were randomized to the treatment arm, they got ablated at that visit. And then every six months was seen after that. And any time there was a new HCL lesion, it, they proceeded on to therapy. Again, I'd emphasize, number one, this isn't a screening study. Everyone who came in a study had an HRA exam as well as cytology. And in the treatment arm, the, there wasn't a comparison of treat, treatments were allowed at the discretion of the provider and the patient. So um, anytime there was a suspicious lesion for HCL, it got biopsied and they got retreated then. And every six months, if there was no HCL, everyone was seen. In the active monitoring arm, basically this was no treatment. So we biopsied once a year to confirm persistent HCL. And then um, they were seen every six months for collection of uh, HRA exams, anal swabs, cytology. So again, we screened over 10,000 people. We thought we were going to be screening 17,000 people. We had a, a, quite a few women in the study, 47%. And this should be 6.7% as a typo on that slide of transgender persons. We really tried to reach out and enroll transgender people. We found um, prevalent cancers in 17 individuals at baseline. So these were people who were referred asymptomatic, had an HRA exam, and were found to have anal cancer. And obviously, we're not eligible then to go into study, but we're referred off for treatment. Just quickly go through these randomization tables because the populations are well balanced. There's a 40, almost 4,500 randomized population, equally distributed between the two arms by virtue of randomization. Average age is about 51 years old. Again, anyone 35 and older was eligible to be in the study. Um, median year since HIV diagnosis was 17. So these were pretty much people with well-suppressed HIV long-term survivors long-term living with HIV. And months of follow-up here is, is, is um, 25 months. So a little over two years was the median follow-up, which is an important one when we look at the incidence. And we had pretty good gender distribution here, 15% um, women, 80% men, and um, good balance between the arms. In terms of race and ethnicity, I think this was a study that enrolled a lot of non-white participants. So 33% were non-Hispanic white, 
African Americans at 42 percent, and then Hispanics 17 percent. So tried really to enroll representative populations of people living with HIV. Risk factors mostly um, homosexual risk factors, but some heterosexual, some injection drug use as well in terms of risk factor. And 31 to 33 percent in each arm were smokers, consistent with you know an HIV population. And most everyone had suppressed viral loads. So 80 percent were below 50, 70, another 7 percent below 200. Only a few were not suppressed. And then randomization, well, there were quite a few people with low naters. Their randomization at, at, at CD4 randomization was above 600. So there were about half the people though with low naters and that's consistent with a population that's been living long-term with HIV when therapy wasn't always started as aggressively now. So about half of people did have a nater below 200. And then this is important too, and this becomes a significant risk factor, is the extent of disease at screening. So it's estimated that about 12% of people had over 50% of the anal canal, perianal region involved with HL versus 87% that had less extensive disease. This is a fairly subjective measurement though. So for the results, the initial treatment for HL and the treatment arm, again, this was not randomized, these assignments, once you're randomized the treatment, the majority were uh, infra electrocoagulation of the hyphrication that I showed you, or infrared coagulation. One site was still using that, but the hyphricator actually much quicker and more effective. Um, a, a couple of people went to the operating room for treatment under anesthesia, and then a little bit of use of FUDEX or 5 fluorouracil very little imiquimod used in this population of immunosuppressed people. And then, you know, 86% were treated with at least uh, one therapeutic modality, but, you know, several people had several modalities utilized. Sometimes we'll use Effudex to cytal reduce the bulk of disease and then come back and, and cauterize when you have less disease to cauterize. So in terms of the results here, these are the anchor results. The DSMV was notified when 32 cases were diagnosed, when we call incident cases, not the 17 prevalent cases I noted earlier. So the final analysis so based on the DSMV act action, which occurred uh, a year ago, two years ago this month, actually, nine participants were diagnosed with invasive cancer in the treatment arm and 21 in the active monitor arm. So the median follow-up of 25 months, there was a 57% reduction. That's obviously the comparison of 21 and nine and, and uh, highly significant. So this is really surprising though. Again, the median follow-up here is relatively short. It's only 25 months for these uh, 30 cancer cases. So cancer incidence in the treatment arm then is 173 per 100,000. And in the active monitoring on cancer incidence is 400 per 100,000. That's quite a bit higher than those earlier incident rates that I had showed you. And remember the power to, the study was designed on a power to detect a difference of 50 versus 200 in, in the two arms in the treatment versus the monitoring arm. And actually what we found was much higher cancer incidences of 173 in the active monitoring, uh, treatment arm rather. And instead of 200, we actually saw 400 per 100,000 in the active monitoring arm. So a higher rate of progression to cancer as well. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve of those progression to cancer. The um, blue is the active monitoring arm. So these are the incident cancer cases. And then red is the treatment arm. So one thing I would say, we didn't prevent all cancers developing in the treatment arm. There were those nine cases versus 21, but there is a continuing separation of the curve. And we continue to see more cancers on the study as we follow people. Um, this is the first really well-defined large study of the, effic of the adverse events of, of treatment. And actually this hyphrication treatment is very, very well tolerated we saw very little side effects due to the treatment here in terms of adverse events. Um, these all these other events were HIV related and non-related to HL or, or anal cancer here. So the DSMB met in October of 2021 and recommending stopping the study for efficacy at that point. It was recommended that everyone, the half of people who are in the active monitoring arm would be brought back and off of treatment and virtually everyone agreed to treatment once they knew the results of the study. So we've completed treatment and follow-up in, in all of those people now and they're continuing to be monitored. The study is funded, the NCI wanted to continue to follow this cohort until September, 2024. So we're still seeing everyone on the study here 
and, and all of you until next September, and then the study will terminate. We stopped enrolling and randomizing new people, though, in October of 2021. So the cumulative progression of cancer, again, at 48 months was 0.9% in the treatment arm and 1.8% in the monitoring arm. And the cancer risk was significantly higher in people with greater than 50% of anal perianal canal involved. So the, this is a signif very significant difference. The cancer risk was 185 per 100,000 in people with less than 50% of their canal with lesions versus over 1,000 per 100,000 with a, a very high hazard ratio associated with that. So the more extensive disease definitely was associated with more risk of progression. So what are the implications of this study? Well, the rate of progression from anal HL to cancer is high, higher than the study was even designed to detect. Treatment of anal HL is effective in reducing the incidence of anal cancer. And as I noted, there's still room though for improvement in the treatment of anal HL because we did have nine people that despite treatment progressed to anal cancer over the course of the study with very close monitoring. We definitely need biomarkers for anal HL and for progression and regression. You know, we, we, there's just not the capacity anywhere right now to, to screen everyone living with HIV for anal HL and with the expectation that half of them would find, we would find HL and need to treat and follow them. There's no capacity to do that right now. Um, there's a need for optimization of screening algorithms for HL, and I'll talk about that and show you a couple of examples of that in terms of thinking where we go going forward. There's a need for large-scale um, HRA training programs. Um, David Spock was able to procure some funding from HRSA recently, and we're actually going to be doing a needs assessment of her Ryan White-funded clinics around the country to try to determine what the availability of HRA is, and really, more importantly, what the what the needs and would be to develop training programs to scale up. Um, you know, I had trained um, Dr. Helen Sankowitz Carita. She she was doing her own clinic, and then got recruited away to UCSF, unfortunately. Um, Eli Burnham is now trained in doing them. Eli is a provider, a research clinician at the HIV Positive Research Clinic, and now is, is trained in doing HRA. So we have a second provider trained, which is great, but we need a lot more capacity at our clinic. Um, these data should be included in overall assessment for inclusion of screening and treating anal HL as standard of care. And explore, ex, extrapolation of these results to other immunosuppressed groups of high risk for anal cancer. And I showed you that in that curve earlier on. You know, other, I see a fair number of people with um, post organ transplant or immunosuppressed, uh, post bone marrow transplant, and um, probably screening and treatment would be beneficial in that population. But no one's ever going to do a randomized study like this study was done. So what to do in the short term, again, these are slides from the original anchor presentation in July of 2021. Um, DARE on all people living with HIV annually, a good digital anal rectal exam. Um, screen, and we'll talk about screening algorithms of people living with HIV if, if you have HIV and treatment available or can refer to someone trained in HIV and treatment. And then again, this was an incredibly dedicated group of study participants who agreed to come into a study with a 50-50 chance of being randomized to monitoring or no treatment versus treatment. And treatments oftentimes involve multiple sessions. So it was a very dedicated group of people who allowed this very large clinical endpoint study to be done. So I just have a few more slides and then would like to have some discussion here. But this, these are a couple of proposed algorithms for screening for anal HL. The problem is the cervical algorithms don't really work in, in this population. There's such a high prevalence of high-risk HPV in, in men living with H, uh, HIV or have sex with men. So this is a study done by uh, Michael Geiser at Mount Sinai in New York, looked at anal cytology, HR, HPV DNA testing, which is not FDA approved yet, and HIV guided biopsy results from 1,800 participants um, including the majority were HIV infected men of sex with men, but also had some HIV uninfected men of sex with men, and as well as HIV infected women. So primarily a high risk population here for anal HL. So one approach is to, to do the anal cytology and, and the options for the results of that, then either it's benign or what's usually signed out here is no AIN or anal epithelial and neoplasia. ASCIS, which are 
asymptomatic cells of clinically uncertain, uh, anal c- cells of clinically uncertain significance, and L-cell ASCH, which is basically probable HCL and HCL. So, you know, this group, the ones with L-cell ASCH or HCL need to go to HRA. You have a high, you have a high rate of yield of high-grade dysplasia with this finding. These other groups, though, you can certainly find high-risk or anal HL in people with benign cytology. A fair number of people that I end up biopsying them in high grade have a normal cytology. And then this group, this more indeterminate group of ASCUS, which is probably the most common cytology we'll see if we're screening men or sex with men living with HIV, potentially differentiating these groups based on high risk HPV testing. Um, one approach would be to test the most, refer the ones of the most aggressive types or the ones with all, all positive types of HPV. So we looked at that. And then another an, um, option, you know, it's not uncommon to get an unsatisfactory pap smear either. The more you do, the less common that is, the more aggressive you are really in collecting cells. But still, we'll see I get a couple of, a month of unsatisfactory, a couple of year. And then, th- so this algorithm included the unsatisfactory, the prior one in it. This is a simple algorithm. And looking at just batching together again, L cell ask age H cell needs to go to HRA if you're screening. If it's unsatisfactory, benign, or ask us, this approach would be to do high risk HPV testing and for any positive, including 16 and 18, and that other batch of 15 others for HRA. This is a simple algorithm really to follow and implement if it's negative on the HPV testing, then a repeat cytology. So, when looking at those different options there, what Michael Geiser and his group det- determined was that. You know, anal HL, again, was where this is histologic HL on biopsy in 41, 41% of participants. Again, HL is very prevalent, like we found in, in the anchor study. Cytology had the lowest sensitivity, but highest specificity. So this is the challenge. Any algorithm that we're going to look at trades off sensitivity for specificity and vice versa. So algorithm B turned out to be the most sensitive strategy overall, but wasn't the most specific. And for women, with um, high-risk HPV testing and both algorithms yielded a higher sensitivity than cytology. But specificity was low for all strategies. So screening algorithms that incorporate cytology and HRHPV testing significantly increased sensitivity, but decreased specificity to detect anal cancer, pre-cancer. So this is the challenge in terms of where we go with screening. This study was actually fortuitously just published um, last week. Um, this was the AMC study, AIDS Malignancy Consortium Study 084. And this was a study looking at the two-year incidence and cumulative risk of predictors of anal high-grade epithelial lesions among women with HIV. So this looked at histologic high-grade, again, a biopsy proven high-grade, which I indicate here with the HHL. And, um, and in conclusion, what they found here uh, again, this was um, 229 women living with HIV followed annually for two years with HRA and directed biopsy, and then looked at the correlation of anal high-risk HPV or a- abnormal anal cytology was associated with incident anal HL and um, detection of anal HR, HPV, or abnormal cytology are comparable predictors for two-year cumulative uh, cumulative risk of anal HL, histologic HL. So again, there's, there's not a good, the, the model that we use for cervix doesn't really work in, in anal HL. So just a couple of resources here, and then hopefully we'll leave some time for comments. I know I went through all this very quickly, but I really wanted to cover the, give you kind of a landscape of the field here. There is an International Anal Neoplasia Society. They have a great resource website. I'm actually a member of that. And um, they do a virtual HRA courses. They haven't gone back in person. This is So I started our clinic here at Harborview in February of 2012. Ahead of that, I went down to San Francisco and observed for three days and then took this course. So that's kind of the standard training paradigm we're using now. Um, there is a really nice paper that Ian's published in 2016 on guidelines setting practice standards. The problem right now is no one's going to own a credential or um, HRA providers. General surgeons aren't too interested in it. GI docs are not too interested in it. Infectious disease departments have varying degrees of interest in in developing capacity. So it's a real challenge here. The reimbursement rate is too low to get general surgeons interested in doing this, which I think is where it really belongs myself. 
So one of the challenges here is this is a very long learning curve. You certainly do not observe one, do one, teach one. You maybe observe 25. I spent three and a half days observing down in San Francisco and still was kind of floundering when I started doing them. Um, do 100 work five years and then teach. Uh, lesions can be subtle. And this is one of the problems. The obvious things are oftentimes the warts on low grade dysplasia. The high grade lesions tend to be more subtle. And again, the biggest novice is the biggest pitfall is missing lesions or extent of disease leading to inadequate treatment. Uh, major challenges, again, is procurement of equipment, the high resolution anoscope digital camera, imaging software to capture images is expensive. Um, it's not a coposcope, you need a separate scope. No show rates are relatively high, which is a real problem everywhere in these clinics. Um, working with cytologists and pathologists to have them adopt the last recommendations, I still have to struggle sometimes with some pathology reports to go back and ask them to do P16 staining on those intermediate lesions. Need a referral pattern with a surgeon. Some cases need to go to the OR. Oftentimes it'll be associated fish, fissures, fistulas, or other things. Um, we still need better treatments for anal HL, as we saw in the anchor study. We don't know what the best approach is. Will, will co-testing become the standard of care? What about methylation markers? We did a study here with some encouraging results, at least for advanced disease with methylation markers. Um, anal HPV testing is not yet approved by the FDA. One reason the anchor study hasn't run and doesn't have any data on HR HPV testing is we haven't run the swabs yet. We have swabs on everyone every six months. But Joel Polevsky, the PI in the study, is trying to negotiate with companies and the FDA to run these samples in a way that would lead to FDA approval because anal, cytology, anal HPV testing is not FDA approved yet. And the anchor study has the best opportunity to, to resolve that dilemma. There, the USPS Preventive Services Task Force had comments that were solicited in January, and they're working on looking at uh, reviewing anal screening based on the anchor study, and hopefully over the next year, be interesting to see what they come up with. Ian's has a set of guidelines coming out soon, and as a CDCOI guideline treatments, treatment guidelines should be resolved or revised soon, I should say. And um, there's clearly a lack of capacity here locally and nationally. And uh, what about how, how generalizable, as I noted, are these findings to other immunocompromised individuals? Remind people the vaccine is there. It's permissive to age 46. So we, we know we did a study here locally called the VIVA study that showed the vaccine was not effective therapeutically to reduce HPV acquisition, but it certainly work, works very well to reduce acquisition of strains you haven't been affected with yet. So I wanna thank the Mountain West AETC for helping with this presentation and would like to just open this up, Sharisa, any comments or questions? Sorry, I went through this very quickly, but it is important material to cover. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff. This was an outstanding um, summary and talk about all the work that you've been doing um, with the anchor study and where we are now and potentially where we will be in terms of, of um, implications for our clinical practice. I think everyone is eager to, to figure out how to implement some of this screening into care. There's some good questions in the chat. Um, one is, um, as we often find ASCIS cytology, why not test initially for high-risk HPV versus having to retest? Well, you can do co-testing. I frequently now do both together. And um, I'm using it primarily to determine frequency of follow-up, though, in people who I've treated for high-grade dysplasia. I generally see people every six months for a while because recurrence is a real, it was real, fairly common. Half of people in the anchor study required more than one round of treatment. And um, so then I will do co-testing on those people and order both off the same sample just to see if, if I'm no longer expressing high-risk HPV, then I'll space their follow-up back out to one year instead of every six months. So that's how I'm using it really. But, um, you know, in terms of screening right now, we certainly do not have the capacity locally to screen every, if everyone started doing anal swabs on primary care patients with living with HIV, we would be overwhelmed with abnormal, you know, most of them actually would be ASCUS or greater. And then we have no capacity to do HRA on those people. Yeah, and there is a question about self-swabbing as well. Um, I know yeah. we've talked about it in our clinic. Um, so if you would like to share. Yeah, I forgot to, I was actually just gonna mention that because, um, 
you can't sell swab for cytology. It's just not accurate. You don't get enough sales. Even with a provider doing experience provider doing it, as I noted, still get some unsatisfactory cytologies. There are studies doing self-swabbing for HPV testing, and you can do that. You know, you need much less cellular content to do the DNA analysis for the HPV types. So that could be done. People can self-swab for, for HPV testing, but they cannot self-swab for anal cytology. There's another question about um, using HPV vaccine. I know you mentioned the, uh, the negative results from the VIVA study in terms of um, treatment, but people wondering about if you've had a quadrivalent HPV vaccine in the past, whether you would give an HPV or non-avalent vaccine now. Yeah, the current CDC recommendation is not to do revaccination of people who had the quadrivalent vaccine with a non-avalent vaccine. You know, 16 and 18 are still the most aggressive actors here. Those accounts, 16 accounts for 75% of cervical and anal cancers. So we certainly see a lot. I get a lot of swabs back. And I talked to when I was in Virginia Mason, also with a pathologist there for the other types. We're seeing a lot of other types. There's no evidence, though, that the quadrivalent vaccine caused any uh, genetic shift or migration over to the, to the non-vaccine subtypes. But we certainly are seeing a lot of the other subtypes show up positive. You know, the current um, assay that we're doing doesn't um, subtype individual types other than 16 and 18. It just has that large catchment group that says positive or negative for some or all of those others. So certainly though, so for because 16 and 18 though are still the most aggressive, the CDC does not recommend that you revaccinate people who are at the quad valley. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, I know that the anchor study started at age 35. Um, there's a question about whether in people with HIV, there's any um, recommendation to start earlier than age 35. No, if, if anything, actually, the anchor team thinks maybe we should start a little later. We saw very, very few cancers. We're, we're, I'm on two writing groups now. We're writing secondary manuscripts right now on um, the incident cancers and the prevalent cancers, and, and we'll look at the ages and report on them. But, you know, the majority of people who get anal cancer are in the mid-40s to 50s. So there is an age-related spectrum, even with HIV. I mean, I've seen a couple of people in their late 30s with anal cancer, but that's really uncommon. So, no, I wouldn't advocate starting earlier than 35. If anything, would advocate starting a little later if we, if we develop capacity to start screening locally. And there's a, a question about um, referral for HRA for anal warts. I know that we've talked about how there's a it's a fairly limited resource right now, given the lack of providers who are trained in this area. Um, but if you do have access, would you recommend for anal warts? So, you know, for, for perianal warts, you know, liquid nitrogen works really well. I mean, we use that quite a bit. Also for immunocompetent people, and miquimod works very well. I've seen some really dramatic responses to miquimod. Those can easily be done in the primary care setting for people with perianal warts. Um, for people with bulky warts, I actually refer them to general surgery because I can't treat bulky warts very well other than with topicals with a hyphricator. So I end up referring them to general surgery. You know, I really wanted our clinic to focus on high-grade dysplasia and preventing anal cancer. Um, you know, if you have, you know, a 21-year-old young man with anal warts, I, I would treat him in, in the primary care setting. Great, thank you. Um, I think you might've answered this question already um, about self-swabbing. I know not for cytology, but for HPV screening. Yeah. Would you recommend it just for HPV screening, the self-collection swab? No, because we don't know what where co-testing fits in the paradigm. I think until the anchor study runs their data on HPV swabs, I'm really disappointed we don't have that data yet. I, I understand the desire of the Joel Pleski and other folks on the team to try to run these swabs with an FDA-approved plan so that we get FDA approval for these assays, which we don't have. But it's a, it's a real, you know, where all of our, where our 30 cancers all related to type 16 and 18, it would be great if they were, because then co-testing would really help. 
But if, we're, if we see some of those are due to type 30, 35, or some of the others, then co-testing isn't going to be as helpful, I think. Great. In the um, last few minutes, I, I know that we're waiting for how to um, restratify patients so that we don't send everyone for HRA. In an ideal world, Jeff, how would it look to you for anal cancer screening in for um, people with HIV in our primary care practices? What would you like to, to see as the recommendation? Well, for now, I actually kind of like that second, um, the slide B by Michael Geis that I showed you. That's a pretty simple, involves co-testing for those um, unsatisfactory or no or ASCA swabs, and then referral to HRA for L-cell, ASCH, and H and H-cell. So um, that's a pretty simple paradigm, uh, limited amount of co-testing. But again, we would be seeing over half of all people at Madison Clinic for HRA. So that that's a challenge. Someone's asking if I can share this slide again for the B and let me do that. So people can see my screen again, I assume here. Yes. It just went to the end of the slide show. You were on it and then it. it oh, okay. Yeah. Back. All right. So this was the B paradigm. You know, this is a simpler one to retain. A was a lot more complicated, if you remember. But B here is the anal cytology. If it's L cell, ASC H or H cell, go to HRA. If it's unsatisfactory, benign, or ASCUS, then have kind of reflexive co testing like we do in the cervix then do HRA, H HPV testing. If it's positive, independent of the type, not just 16 or 18, refer to HRA. If it's negative, you know, follow up with annual cytology. And this again is a population increased risk for anal cancer. So pretty simple schema here with uh, reflexive co-testing in, in the ones that don't get referred immediately to HRA. And the results of that co-testing then determine. This I think makes the most sense for now. But again, we really need to see the data from Anchor on the HPV testing to, to help. And again, Anchor was not a screening study. Everyone went to HRA. So Anchor is gonna be limited to some degree on how much it can inform these paradigms. We do have writing teams looking at prevalent HCL and so forth. We're trying to tease some of that out, but until we get the code testing data, it's limited what Anchor can contribute to this, the data set we currently have. Great, thank you so much, um, Jeff. There's one other question. Um, given the limited capacity, are there people that we should focus on more? Um, people older than 50, maybe, given the statement about you know older individuals in the anchor study, um, smokers or severely immunocompromised. Yeah, I think that's a great. I was going to mentioned that, and it's a great suggestion. We've talked about that within the anchor team. There were a lot of debates when Joel presented this data in July uh, in 2021 about making recommendations. He, he, he didn't, since anchor doesn't have any data to, to inform this, he didn't want to make recommendations, but we've talked about th this is the kind of paradigm I think maybe we need to, in, as, as an intermediate phase, when we develop more HRA capacity. So, you know, if you remember, there, there was extent of disease, but we don't have any way to screen to know when someone has more than 50% without doing the HRA. So that doesn't help. Although that's a really strong predictor of risk of anal cancer. But smoking, 30% with smokers, Nader CD4 below 200 is an important one. And I, and I think um, currently non-suppressed um, viral load, but you know, virtually all of our patients have suppressed viral loads now, so that isn't going to help a whole lot. But certainly 50 years and older smokers and a native below 200 would be a reasonable population, like John suggested, to consider sc limited screening uh, as we try to ramp this up. Thank you and so much. And the question about or oh. the question about Oregon, there there is um, someone is doing HRA down in Portland, but nowhere else. And there's no one doing HRA outside of Seattle other than 
Dr. Wanda Laosa is a polyclinic. There's a couple of people at Virginia Mason. That's about it. The Kaiser Group is interested in starting something up as they don't have any capacity now, or the, and the VA doesn't do it. So we have such limited capacity. It's kind of frustrating. You know, the 11 years I've been doing this, haven't been able really to build up a lot of capacity. Um, it's great that Eli is now trained, but Eli's primary responsibilities are over at the HIV research, positive research clinic. Thank you so much. We'll end with a call for people who are interested in pursuing additional training uh, yeah. that's in this much needed area. Thank you so much, um, Jeff, for this uh, outstanding talk and summary of um, the data from Anchor and implications um, and hope to see some guidelines soon and increased capacity. So thank you again. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone.